again, I'm Amber, and thank you. Um, we are really, really excited to be here, and um, I wanna share with you a little bit about what we've been working on over the last, um, last year, and then also I'll, I'll um, hand over the conversation to the panelists. I wanna give you a little background about Idaho, and um, just to talk about the context for this conversation, Idaho is facing severe changes based on climate. So we have weather, increased temperatures, drought, decreased snowpack, and those changes affect um, the top five industries that are the main economic drivers for the state of Idaho. That's manufacturing, which includes technology and the timber industry, as well as healthcare, tourism, agriculture, and the food and beverage processing industry. As we see these changes, one of the challenges in Idaho is as a conservative state, often the conversation around, <coughs> excuse me, the smoke has been affecting my lungs. The conversation around climate change has become highly politicized. So we have to be very strategic in how we talk about climate change and frame it in economic terms. So last November, we had a conversation around how Idaho is facing um, these changes and how Idaho is safeguarding um, the economy. So the Idaho Climate Summit had 575 participants from around the state and leaders from all of the major industry sectors and a lot of the major employers throughout the state of Idaho. We had 53 sponsors, 92 presenters, um, 27 exhibitors, 48 facilitators, and 34 volunteers. Um, we had four locations um, where we had live facilitation and then we streamed across the entire state. I feel like that was a huge success and it was a testament to the fact that everyone across the state is seeing these changes and is concerned about these changes regardless of the politics involved in the conversation. That we talked about forest and wildfire, health and quality of life, recreation, fish and wildlife, agriculture and rangeland, and infrastructure in the built environment. And a lot of the conversations that happened in the room were in um, small groups, tables of 10, where facilitators walked the groups through design thinking processes to arrive at actionable solutions. Um, we combined those actionable solutions and a lot of the discussion was around risk, economic cost, as well as growth and competitive opportunities. But really what we dove into was how do we solve for water, wildfire, and health and, hum and quality of life as some of the key topics. The outcomes were, um, one, as a group, and as the big co conference c finished up and wrapped up, um, we consolidated all of the solutions and met with the steering committee to decide on a strate strategic path forward. The first one was to produce a risk analysis for the state of Idaho. So we are partnering with all of the players and everyone involved in the conversation to basically develop this report. And so if you're interested in getting involved, please come and talk with me. Um, the second one is to develop local workshops and focus on the local perspective because really action and changes happened at the local level. And then three, to develop working groups that are more industry specific and focused. And then four is to support other efforts. So we are um, supporting the November um, climate conference in Boise, which is a science and academic based conference. Um, and some of the key themes were to use metrics and economics, focus on local, think in systems, and collaborate. And that's what we're really excited about is the opportunity for collaboration and bringing um, folks together across different sectors and political um, ideals. Um, so I would like to introduce our panelists today. And in the, for the sake of time, I will let them just continue going. So we have John Bernardo, um, who's a sustainability strategist, strategist with Idaho Power, and Sharon Grant and Lauren McLean and Greg Servine. So John. Thank you. <clears throat> Following up Amy uh, this morning when she was setting a benchmark for location, et cetera, I just want to clear something up. This state was not named after the local electric company, like a lot of people believe it was. <laughs> In fact, if you look into it, you'll see that the word Idaho is a completely made up name just to break us out of the Oregon uh, territory back in 1863. I'm gonna to read to you, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about Idaho Power's climate change adaptation plan that we have announced that we are developing. And we announced it in this document, which is our 
seventh sustainability report. Oops, and there it is. So I'm just going to read you the definition from the beginning of the article on climate change. Climate change is, simply put, a notable diversion from the expected weather patterns. Idaho Power recognizes the need to adapt to an ever-changing climate and is preparing for potential impacts to its operations. That's why we're doing it. I also want to give credit to Jeff Goodell. I appreciated his comment today that make risk transparent for everyone. I would just modify it and say make risk and opportunity transparent for everyone, which is why, again, this is a very public-facing plan that we are developing. This is the uh, climate change plan, and we have identified four areas right now that we think we need to focus on to be prepared for future events in our service area. And our service area is southern, er uh, southern Idaho and eastern Oregon. The first is fish and other aquatic resources. When you put hydroelectric facilities in the Snake River and its tributaries, you are obligated to take care of the animal and plant species that are in that, uh, those tributaries in the river. So a lot of our work is compliance work. Our utility is a little different than others. Uh, we have 2,000 employees, 80 of which are scientists. That does not include all the engineers. We do a lot of the compliance work and the assessment work internally. We have three meteorologists on staff. I'm happy that one of my colleagues, Mel Kunkel, a meteorologist, is here today. Those are the folks who are telling us things are changing and we need to adapt. The next area is the, the potential for climate change to have on our demand. So our current customer count, these are all 2017 numbers, but we like any other electric utility, you build so you can make, you can meet peak demand, the one day, the one hour, when it is the greatest demand for electrical energy. We usually hit that in July, in late July, in late afternoon. I'm not sure we've hit our peak yet for this year, and it's August. So we have to adapt and be ready resource-wise to meet those demands, and obviously in this state, that demand is primarily air conditioning and irrigation for all the agricultural products. Third is hydro. We pride ourselves on our hydro system. Last year, we generated 49.5% of our energy from those 17 hydroelectric facilities. We had a good water year last year. We're having a good water year this year, but one reason to do a climate change plan is to try to predict what's the water going to be like in future years. And it's not just the amount of precipitation, it's also the form that precipitation takes. If we don't get as much snowfall, we don't have as much snowpack, we don't get the spring runoff, it limits our ability because water is a fuel for us. And the last area is what we're dealing with today. And I really appreciate the question that came up earlier about the wildfires and are we prepared? And that's exactly why we're doing a climate change adaptation plan. So this is an example of some efforts we've made already. We cleared the vegetation around the base of some poles and you can see that the wildfire went around it but the pole never reached flashpoint so we did not have an outage. Now, there's some environmental impact there, yes, however, it would be much greater if we had to go in and replace a burned out pole and customers suffer with an outage. So this is just one step we're looking at because our transmission and distribution system is our fourth area that we're primarily concerned about. And with that, I'll leave it to my colleague Sharon. Um, well, I'm going to kick off by saying that if anybody listened to some of the talks yesterday and Jeff talked about trust in governments is going down, do we all agree with that? Yes. Okay. But I am going to challenge Eamon, who said that governments are not part of the solution. 
The reason for that is I think it's which government we're looking at, and I'm gonna give you some Idaho perspective as well as some national perspective on that, um, because I think really it's about cities leading the way. So if we look at some of the risks, we know that on a federal level, we've got a major issue. This is not new news to everybody. We know there's only one country in the entire world not in the Paris Climate Accord right now, that is the United States, which is horrifying after all the effort that went in by Al Gore and so many others to bring in India and Nicaragua and some of these um, countries that were holdouts in the original Paris Climate Accord. So we've got this horrible thing happening on a federal level where we don't have an agreement to be a part of the rest of the world. Another thing that we see happening is that 75% of global CO2 emissions are coming from city and urban areas. So where do we wanna put our attention? We wanna put our attention in cities and urban areas and where the buildings are primarily, secondarily transportation. I've seen other presentations give you all those breakdowns between buildings and transportation. So think about this, in the next two decades, 60% of our built environment will lock in emission patterns for 80 to 120 years. I'm gonna steal something from a colleague of mine that I was just at a conference in Austin with the Department of Energy. How many of you know that the home that you grew up in is still standing? I'm gonna to venture to say that's about 95% of this room. How many of you know if the home that your parents grew up in is still standing? Okay, we might be at 50 or 60%. What about your grandparents? Is that a bit of a reality check when we quote 80 to 120 years? And not to dismiss the presentation straight before me that talked about a 30 to 40 year pattern, but we may be locking in for a whole lot longer than that, these emissions patterns, with the biggest culprits in emissions in our, in our climate. I don't think I need to run through the risks. I mean, we all know wildfire is the hottest risk in Idaho in terms of what our concerns are. You can tell by the smoke we're experiencing right now. But we also look at it in terms of the potential for flooding, crop failure, water shortages, spreading diseases, infrastructure disruption, instability. I have a degree in ecological design. We, we looked at sustainable city design and how you actually put together a sustainable city. And if you don't really think through how you're gonna have equality in the ecology, the social, the economic, the political, those kind of instabilities can be a huge, huge disruptor. So what I wanna focus on is that the risk may be global. The, the globe is seeing all of those risks that I just mentioned, but the solution is local. That's where we have the opportunity. In my opinion, cities have the right scale to make the impact we need for our entire globe to change. I'm not the only one thinking that. If you look at the World Resource Institute, they've published many, many studies on this and they are identifying that cities are the opportunity. That's where we can make the impact to really change our emission patterns. So let's look at opportunities. You know that the US pulled out of the, US cli or the Paris Climate Accord. Any idea what 407 stands for? <laughs> Amy knows. These are the number of mayors that have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord in the United States. Does that tell you how many cities are devoted to this and willing to make a commitment to lowering their emissions? These are where all the cities are located. Proud to say that you know Bellevue, Boise, Ketchum, all of those mayors have signed on, but we've got a lot of work to do in Idaho to get a few more to sign on. C40, just to talk about more of what we see happening with cities. There's a group called the C40 Initiative. It's about 12 cities. These are the cities. They have an initiative to say that they will have a zero emission part or sector of their city by the year 2030. They've also made a commitment that they're gonna have zero emission bus buses. Those combined 12 cities have 59,000 buses in their fleet. So if we start looking at the impact by just those core, C4, that C40 group and those 12 cities that are willing to commit to that, we start to see where that can have a pretty significant impact in not just the transportation, but in the building patterns. And in a lot of the work that I do with cities and consulting with cities, we look at the same sort of goals that they have with that 2030 challenge. 
So the 2030 challenge is about getting new construction to 70% reduction on energy use compared to a baseline. So the baseline, um, if we look at today, and we want to start pushing towards carbon neutral buildings, there's a cap on the amount you can do RECs and you can do renewables, but it's about 70% reduction. And I can tell you it's possible. I'm not gonna to steal too much from Lauren's presentation, hopefully, but Boise is one of the cities that I've worked with. We worked on their new fire stations, which are two award-winning stations, four and eight. Instead of having the typical energy use of a fire station, they set a 27 EUI target, which is the amount of energy per square foot per year, which is equivalent to saying they wanted to see a 70% reduction according to the 2030 challenge tra trajectory. They achieved it in both stations. So, what I'd like to say is every city should be building stations like that at this stage. Um, the other interesting thing that happened in Boise with the fire stations is in working with them on strategic energy management, which is what my company does, we looked at not just the new buildings, but we also looked at old buildings. We also looked at crossing the different silos and, and cross-departmental divisions that tend to happen. So when the airport manager for that department found out that the new fire stations could get to a 27 EUI on their energy use, he turned around and looked at the people running his renovation of the one fire station out at the airport and said, well, it's not good enough if we're targeting, I think they were targeting like a 50 or like upper 40s. They redid their design to get to a 28 EUI. So we saw this happen where cross-departmental communication and lessons learned and success stories shared was really starting to make an impact, not just in the new buildings, but in the existing buildings. So the existing building targets in the 2030 challenge are to get to a 50% reduction. So most of the cities that I work with, we look at that trajectory. We want all their existing buildings to go to 50% energy use reduction by 2030, new buildings be carbon neutral. These are the 2030 districts. So again, that C40 initiative that's happening globally, these are the cities most um, that are in the United States that have started to put a 2030 district in place where they wanna take it to zero emissions by the year 2030. Um, so again, I won't try to steal from Lawrence if she's gonna mention the live district in Boise, hopefully you will. Um, they're not in the 2030 district officially, but they have a similar idea that you don't try to do the entire community at once. But if the city starts by leading by example with their own operations, their own buildings, their own transportation, then creates a smaller district where you start to get a private partner, private public partnership going, that's where we start to see an impact where the community starts to sign on. Then move into the policies that start to really shift community-wide emissions and building and transportation patterns. Um, some of the other initiatives, I'm, you know, in eight minutes, I'm not going to be able to go through a whole bunch of them. So I'm simply going to say that the City Energy Project, there's 20 cities that signed on that were looking to have significant change in their energy use and in their energy policies. Um, so they've successfully put disclosure ordinances in place, which is a major initiative we see that's effective throughout cities, where all we do is say, share your energy information, share your energy use. We're seeing those as voluntary, we're seeing them as mandatory in um, almost 30 cities across the United States right now. We're also seeing that become mandatory in real estate transactions in places like Portland, where you can't sell a residential home without sharing what your energy use is right now. Um, this is a, the system that we've developed. We call it strategic energy management. We think it's about engaging the right people, setting the right goals, not just a vision for 2030, but the interim goals that are gonna get you there. Benchmarking, you can't manage what you don't measure. We get cities to benchmark all their operations for their energy use. We look at diagnostics, virtual audits, and then we look at in-person audits and getting out into the field and figuring out where opportunities are to really implement change. Um, so this is the process we use. We've published a national guide through the U.S. Department of Energy that is geared towards all small to medium-sized cities across this nation that they can utilize. Some of the cities that we're working with are Boise, Grand Rapids, Eugene, Missoula, Providence, Rhode Island. We're in discussions with Anchorage. We're in discussions with Pittsburgh. We're also now in discussions with New York State on how do we work with a city cohort across the entire state to try to look at them adopting energy emission reduction goals in using this SEM process. This is an example of the sustainability report that came out of the process of working with Boise and some of their energy goals. These are the number of zero energy buildings. Again, you see that coastal thing happening. 
this is the approach we use. We don't want to see renewables put on first thing, but we look at efficiency first. We also look at 100% renewable energy cities, and I give them a, a whole lot of credit. In Idaho, we don't have that flexibility with how some of the legislative changes and the PUC changes have happened here. Local opportunities. Realize that buildings are the biggest threat. Transportation is number two. Vote. Join a citizen advisory group. Support policies, codes, and standards when they are adopted to try to lower emissions. Act now. What is Ketchum doing? I'll let you ask me questions about this. Um, we're looking at a major energy, water, and waste reduction plan for the city of Ketchum. So if anybody's curious to know more details about what we're doing in Ketchum, then just ask during the question. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren McLean. I'm on the city council in Boise. And I really appreciate being here to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do with our city. A um, couple things. I appreciate you wor working with us um, and helping us to figure out how to lead in the state. But also, I'd love to see that eventually we can be leading nationally when it comes to um, clean energy, water resource renewal, um, sustainability writ large as we think about how the world is changing and how we can do the best for our citizens. Um, and a couple things. Um, Steve mentioned that government people don't really, aren't really thinking about this or we haven't adopted it. And I can assure you we are thinking about um, the puzzles of housing and um, sustainability, resource planning, and all of that all the time. And it's really, I agree with Sharon, it's really, I think, an exciting place to be um, at the city level thinking about what, what we can do to impact climate. And when people ask me why I geek out over city issues like zoning, um, housing requirements, all these different things. It's really because I see this nexus between um, long-term climate impacts and the decisions that we make at the local level. And, and really, the decisions that I get to help make are those decisions that will um, make it so that we're better able not only to adapt, um, but to thrive from economic opportunity and quality of life perspective as the climate changes. And over the last, so I've been on the city council for seven years now, and I can say that that thinking, um, as a joint body, I feel really lucky to serve alongside five other people on our council um, and with Mayor Beter. Um, the thinking about this puzzle piece um, as, a, as a city, um, all, how all the pieces go together, um, has evolved, and we all share these values of, of um, trying to make the, the right decisions for the future. Um, Sharon mentioned the, the sustainability work that we're doing. Um, I want to, there's a couple things I'll say. These are, we've, we have developed a climate adaptation plan, and it covers water, transportation, energy, um, and then materials management. But this came out of a sustainability program that we launched probably four or five years ago. Um, and this thinking that we share that um, it's, if we want to have a, um, a successful, thriving city and be able to cre create opportunities for our residents, then we have to look at take almost the triple bottom line approach where we're looking at the nexus of um, social justice, um, e um, environmental sustainability, and economic opportunity. And so our sustainability program is actually called Live Boise. Um, and you see that woven throughout if you go to our website or, or, or are a citizen. Um, in the programs, Live stands for lasting environments, innovative economies, and vibrant community. So we use that lens now when we're making policy decisions, and our staff uses that lens when they're implementing day-to-day -day programs, and then also trying to come up with alternatives for us to choose between. I thought I would cover today um, two pieces of our live and clim climate adaptation work, and that's energy and water. I'm recognizing that, um, as was mentioned, transportation is a key piece of that. Our city um, in our state doesn't have oversight of roads decisions, so we do what we can when it comes to investing in um, more buses, trying to, to um, actually create housing requirements that will increase the demand for transit, but at the end of the day, we don't, have, we don't build the roads or decide how they're, um, how they're planned because there's a roads district that does that, and we do not have a funding source for a large-scale transit system that we really need to create. So on, um, and so I'm gonna first talk a little bit about our energy strategy. 
um, we're looking at all of these pieces, recognizing that um, the cost of energy, while right now in Idaho it's cheap, and it's kind of made it so that there's not the citizen um, or market demand for a lot of alternatives because we don't have the monthly pocketbook pressures um, that'll, that'll drive that. And so we, but we believe that we cannot rely on the current um, cheap cost of power, given that there will likely be carbon um, costing in the future, um, less water, all these things that will create different dynamics than we're experiencing right now um, that will make it so that we are best positioned for, to protect our citizens and to have space for economic opportunity if we're planning forward. Um, and so this is, this is a, I just wanted to give this as background. We know right now that um, people within the Boise city limits, so this is not the whole valley, um, spend about $326 million on fossil fuels. And that's going to a whole bunch of different places, not to our state. And if we actually, so if we, if we look at that and we think about not only energy security in, in terms of who we're relying on to power our city and our businesses, um, but also um, what that money could do if it wasn't going elsewhere, and we come up with this. We could um, put solar power on 20,000 buildings, um, purchase thir 13,000 zero emission electric vehicles, or heat six over 6,000 commercial buildings downtown, downtown really where the district is with geothermal en energy. And so um, this is where right now the energy that we have in Boise comes from. So we're looking at all of this as we do our planning and really appreciate the, the partnership that Idaho Power has um, developed with us um, alongside us to one, um, finally get access to the, the information on where how much energy we're using so that then we can create goals to reduce it. Um, but this is where I always get really excited about and Sharon mentioned the live district so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, the city of Boise has, um, as this little chart says, the, the largest direct use system in the US and we actually have the sixth largest geothermal system in the world. Um, in many ways that's already tapped but I actually think it's an untapped resource as well. And so um, the colors on this map right now are where the geothermal um, exists and currently serves, and some of its legacy. The, the city, um, folks that live out Warm Springs Road um, created a district that, pa that um, heated their homes long, long time ago. The state house, the, the VA, um, all of these state and federal buildings are powered or heated, excuse me, by geothermal. And then we've, uh, we've sought grants as often as we can from the Department of Energy to be able to extend that system. And now, um, one place downtown we actually call Live District, and the idea was, um, it, it ties into geothermal. Um, the idea was that there, there, the USGBC, the local outfit developers, others, were interested in bringing an eco-district to Boise. And so we had this theory that if we could develop a district downtown that I would love eventually to be on that 2030 list, um, where it's all self-sustaining from a power re and resource perspective. Um, if we could develop a live district, so Boise, Boise solution and Boise name, um, that relied on extending the geothermal, I wanted and we wanted to test the case um, that we could actually encourage um, new businesses to locate there, um, really see if we could see some innovative solutions to creating um, or to help us, helping us extend the geothermal system, um, and, and how fast it would take then to see investment in econ economic growth within a district if we did something cool like this. So the city um, extended the geothermal system. We funded th with the urban renewal district some of that, and then um, did landscape and streetscape redevelopment. And that, it, it's a spot downtown, if you guys have been to Boise, that's, I always, I, when people say, well, where's the live district? I'm like, it's between Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. It's like that stretch. And then between the two really big, busy streets that everybody say are a problem in Boise, Front and Myrtle. Um, and so, for years and years and years, this district had just been dormant because it's between two really busy streets. The train tracks used to be there, and then it became busy highway streets. Um, a couple businesses located there, and we developed this live, live district concept. Um, and it is the, and the area of downtown that has seen the highest intensity of redevelopment in the last five years, which is really cool. And the, there's, there's multifamily housing there now. There are businesses, startups are going down there. 
and the developers of many of them have tapped into our geothermal system and where they couldn't with the hotels and the multifamily housing use it to, to heat the entire building, they were actually willing to sit down with me and explain to me why they couldn't, um, but then what they wanted to do to be able to electrify long term. So it's, I, if, if, you're in, if you haven't been in the area and you're in Boise soon, just go check it out. There's, you, if you wouldn't know that this stuff is happening if you hadn't seen the slide, um, but it's our hope that we can figure out how to extend our system further, use new technology that allows us to reuse water, and thereby be able to heat more buildings and get off natural gas long term. So um, we're, we know we're right here right now, and we, in the next month, will be meeting as a council to discuss and approve our goal of um, hitting a 100% renewable energy target by 2040 citywide. Um, and it's my hope and I plan to push our council to also create a city, city government specific goal um, that's 2030 or 2035. I'm working with um, public works staff on that right now. And so we know that we need to partner with Idaho Power. Some of the things um, that will make this possible will have to be done by the state. So there's things that we can do and we know we have to do those first and as a city government, walk the walk. Um, but then we'll need partners. Oh shoot, I have a typo on my slide. Oh. Um, <laughs> we'll need part, oh I shouldn't have said that because now I'm really embarrassed. Um, we'll, need, we'll need partners um, to make this goal a reality. Um, but we think that when we break down all of um, the energy uses and where the, the intensity is comes from, we can get there. Um, and so Sharon mentioned this, we also do, as a city, have both new building goals and existing building goals. <coughs> and I have to say, I probably forgot to say at the beginning, our public work staff is just incredible. And they're the ones that are making all of this um, possible, because we can say that we want to do it, um, but they know how to do it. I can't do these numbers things and talk about buildings. Um, and if it weren't for them working with us, we wouldn't be where we're at, and so really, really appreciate them. And Public Works is really where it's at when it comes to the new world and the things that cities need to do for, for climate. And so we mentioned the fire stations. We have these two beautiful new fire stations um, that did meet our targets, and from a city council perspective at those meetings, um, we got a lot of pushback originally on the costs that it would make that we, okay, great. Um, the costs that were required in order to hit this. And what we recognized was that we'd rather invest in these costs now because long term, um, it, it'll have an impact. And then finally, I'm, I don't get to talk about water um, because I'm out of time, but we have a zero energy building that's actually creating energy now rather than be, being zero energy. So we're gonna do more. The one thing I do wanna just show you a picture of is this, um, and then I'll be done. In addition to the energy work that we're doing, we've actually renamed our sewer treatment plant to the water renewal facility. And we are, I'm really geeking out on how we, ha we can have this one water concept and get to the point where we have um, drinkable water, recognizing that um, just as carbon will be priced and we will be constrained in the future, so too will we, we, will we be restrained by water. And it is the most responsible thing that we can do as a city to prepare for that. Um, so that we are ready from an economic perspective as well as a social justice pr perspective long term. So thank you all um, for listening. I'm going to move to the next slideshow, this, and then um, we'll welcome up the next person. Great. Thanks so much. How's it going out there? Great. Lunchtime, right? Not far, not far. So I, I want to thank Amy and Amber for this opportunity. This, is, um, this has been a great uh, experience and some outstanding discussions. And to be in the room with a lot of these great folks out there has just been an honor. So much appreciated uh, from my perspective. So um, I'm a wildlife biologist. I'm a 30-year employee of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, a government employee. So coming in here, I'm kind of like, and this is the first time I've been to this uh, function, and it's kind of like, hmm, how am I going to fit here? <laughs> so I figured, what the heck? And and uh, wh what I've uh, what I've uh, learned is that uh, we we do have a lot in common because I feel the the more I've um, as I've taken things in, I think uh, we would all respond the same to to what I've thought we would get. Uh, or how we would react to uh, hearing 
we can't do that, we don't do that, this is the way we've always done it. And I think we're all the same in that regard, and I think that's where our commonality is, and so that's what I very much learned and want to take forward here is join all you and what we're trying to do in terms of producing results. So as a, a state employee of the, uh, the Department of Fish and Game, our mission is to, okay, thank you. So I work to preserve, protect, perpetuate, and manage all fish and wildlife in the state of Idaho for its citizens and to provide harvestable surplus of uh, those fish and wildlife for hunting and fishing and trapping. So that, to me, is a pretty good job. It's not too bad. Uh, and in doing that job, is our science and our information within the agency is telling us, you know, that we have effects related to climate that are, that are impacting that mission and that we need to address that if we're going to be able to preserve, protect, and manage that, and if we're going to continue to provide harvestable surplus. And so we need to, be, we need to take action in response to our shareholders and our constituents, because we, we see hotter, drier summers and warmer, wetter winters. And so from the fish and wildlife aspect of this is, our, we have numerous plans that have identified where, where we're gonna have species at risk including, for example, salmon that are migrating all the way from the Pacific Ocean all the way up here to Idaho, and how those drier, hotter summers and the water availability is going to affect that and how we need to address that, as well as then what that's going to mean in, in terms of water flowing out of the system. And, the, and also, so that's the risk side, and then the opportunity side for us is then so, well, we have an opportunity for the state of Idaho. Maybe we could provide some some benefits there as we manage, for example, beaver. And if we looked at, at the landscape scale level across all the watersheds in Idaho, producing beaver and managing for beaver and healthy riparian systems would attenuate and hold water in the high level of systems that then would potentially not only benefit our fish and wildlife, but then also benefit power users, irrigators, and other things. And, and also that we, as we look at these uh, um, difficulties that we face, we also need to take a landscape approach. So we need to start sort of uh, getting across some of the lines that we have previously managed within, for example, within our own authority in the state, as given to us by the state, and start looking at, at range-wide distribution or perspective of the species we're managing. So for example, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies is developing information systems and decision support tools across for the entire West. So I just want you to think about that a little bit. This is something that the Western Association, so the state of Idaho is working with the state of California, is working with the state of Arizona, is working with the state of Colorado, Alaska, Washington. We're all getting together to decide how, what is the data you have, how does it need to fit, and how do we provide a comprehensive, coherent, sans boundary border line picture that then will help decision makers and us preserve and protect and perpetuate the fish and wildlife that we're supposed to deliver. Um, and, and then in terms of opportunities here in the, in the state of Idaho, one of the, the climate risk and opportunity thing is, well, we're gonna have milder winters. So that's actually, that's gonna really decrease over winter mortality of our big game species. So our elk, our deer, our antelope, our moose are gonna have milder winters. They're gonna have greater over winter survival, which means lots of them, which our hunters are more than enthused about. That's just like outstanding, <laughs> which is just something we're, we think that's fantastic too. Now the risks are then, well, we have very abundant game species, but what if hunters aren't can't get into places to hunt because it's closed for fire? Or what if fire affects habitat or they're so abundant that then they be, go on to private land, agricultural producers, and we get that kind of conflict, which then we're, then we're faced with what do we do with that? And of course, the impact to private landowners and ag producers is real and something that not necessarily a good thing in terms of very abundant game species. So those are the kind of risks, opportunities that we're trying to manage and then address this in terms of, okay, related to climate change, how do we forward this 
and make a difference here and start managing in that aspect of things that is different than we have in the past. And I think the other main thing as we evaluate this is much of fish and wildlife management is based on a historical perspective. We know from whence fish and wildlife come, their habitat, their use, and how they evolved. So we manage based on that. So now we need to look forward and what it is we really need to do based on what's going to happen, not what has happened. So to that end, that's why we uh, looked at developing the, as Amber mentioned, the climate summit to try to get to constructive conversations about adaptation. And we, we approach this from, it's not about climate change, it's about changing climate. And we use that very specific language here in the state, which as you can imagine could sometimes be a very blow things up because I think that, that avoided the, what might be a very high level, everybody into their tribal corners and got it to a point of, let's talk about it from a problem solving. Let's talk about how it's affecting you in your business, your quality of life, your recreational opportunity, and go to the people there as well as then talk about the leadership that, that's being taken already in the state of Idaho and be able to highlight that and say, there are people in the state of Idaho, this is being addressed, here are the various examples of that. And so that's some of what we sort of brought forward in the Climate Summit to help us as a Fish and Wildlife Agency move ahead and forward those discussions and do it constructively and meet people where they're at for the impacts that they're seeing and then try to forward things from there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Um, I, is this working? Great. Um, thank you, all of you. I, I'm really excited to have all four of you here in this conversation. And we have time for a few questions. Um, so, but I have actually a question for the four of you, which is really what do you see as a unique opportunity for Idaho in particular related to um, climate change? Does anyone want to start? And I, I guess, you know, Greg kind of already mentioned that, but I think. I'll jump in. It's not a one specific opportunity, but Greg, Greg alluded to the fact that we're a red state. Um, and so, and, but both governor, both candidates for governor this year have gone on the record as, as recognizing that climate change is indeed happening and is something that is impacting our state um, and all of her resources as well as people. And so I think the opportunity that we have is to be leaders from a red state perspective, um, both from a cit for city leaders, um, but then statewide, show other red states in this country that it's in our best interests um, to address these issues and pl to plan accordingly. And only if we do that long term will we be able to thrive. And I would just add that um, in addition to the energy and the, and the climate change that we talked about and the impact on energy and how it's generated where it comes from. Water is crucial. Water will be the key resource for this century. And so I think the opportunity, Amber, is to try to convey to the public the importance of energy efficiency, but also water efficiency at the same time. And it goes to a lot of the work that you do, Sharon. But I think that's really important. We shouldn't do one, see what the impact is, and then go to the other. We really should do it, and we have the opportunity to do it in a multiple manner. Um, I also, one of the things that I wanted to bring out that we didn't discuss yet about the Climate Summit was um, the conversation around seeing all of these systems as, as integrated. And um, one of our forestry leaders who was part of the Climate Steering Committee, or the Climate Summit Steering Committee, um, he really talked a lot about the relationship between the upper sh watershed areas and the forest and forest management and how that relates to water, which then relates to energy, which relates to city services, and how the forest is a lot of where the, the work needs to be done as well. And so I just wanted to mention something around um, proper forest management and sustainable forest management is really key in a big conversation in Idaho. Um, I wanted to open up conversations to, to the audience and see if there's anybody who had questions. Hi, Greg. Let's see. Is it working? Yeah. Um, what's the impact of wildfire on um, 
uh, big game and even small game sage grouse migration. Um, a number of us got a, a pre-evacuation notice last night, uh, n uh, north uh, uh, and east of Haley. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about today. Right. So that you know. I think the frequency and the intensity of those things are, are what's changing. So anything that burns sagebrush is bad. And the thing about sagebrush in the state of Idaho is there are no small sagebrush fires. You know, half a million acres, that sort of thing is the norm. So relative to sage grouse, which used to be, which is a game, currently a game species and was tremendously abundant, is, is continuing to be impacted by fire. On the forest side, Fires in the forest are actually, that's a positive for big game in terms of habitat. They like that early successional, increases forage and nutrition. But of course, at a scale that then becomes prohibitive, and if, and if that's the only kind of habitat they have, and their summer habitats are then decreased, and they have, and, and their migration or movements and their ability to transition into different habitats is being affected, that's not so good. So we need to then think of as that is actually changing, those changes are happening, we need to think about how we're going to manage for that, for that effect in the future. I'll throw out one quick idea on how to manage that that I'd love to see happen in Idaho. Um, was listening to BBC recently and they said what they're doing in Europe and it's unusual to have the wildfires we've seen in Europe happen this season. Um, they are trying to bring back goat herding. And as a state that is so entrenched with sheep herding, I would love to see Idaho bring back goat herding in a way that that starts to manage our underbrush and start to mitigate it against wildfire. So it's a little bit of a far-fetched idea, <laughs> but I'm throwing it out there for conversation and you know, it's something that maybe it could happen in a state with as much rural as we have. So it, as, a, as, the wild, as a wildlife manager, I would just submit one side, we, as, in terms of goats, we would be cautious on disease relative to bighorn sheep. And another side, we'd have to manage goats relative to wolves and how those would get along or not. So that would be the trick. We had a question back there. Hi, thanks, excellent panel. Um, as someone who packed up with the pre-evacuation notice this morning, we know it was an exploding target that started this. And I'm curious, Greg, your thoughts on opportunities to engage with that piece of Idaho culture, community, I'm son of a hunting family, um, but with the gun piece, I would just love your thoughts on where are you finding common communication strategies that really work, that we can engage that piece of the ecosystem as well in Idaho? Right. Um, I wish I had the answer for, you know, what are the common communication strategies. I think the opportunities are that relative to the summit that we had in our, our constituency, you know, which again, a red state, and our constituency tends to be very conservative, but at the same time, they're also the long-term conservationists. They're the ones who've been making investments to perpetuate, protect, and manage these game species so they continue to have that hunting and recreational opportunity. So that's where I think it, we, can, we can have that talk. And I think what's important relative to I think what's important also is the summit got the discussion going. We have a ways to go, so we've, we've started. But I think, we, again, we need to meet people where they're at and talk about the effects, and then that goes to, so, oh, okay, hmm. So what should we do? How should we do this? And then the solutions start to come up and, and cross the boundaries about who needs to talk to what for us to take some action to address whether I'm being impinged on my recreation, or we're losing habitat, or we're losing our quality of life because this is one of the reasons we live in Idaho. I also want to say there's um, a framing of the conversation that's really key. Because when you really get down to it, regardless of your political affiliation, we ultimately truly all want the same thing, which is you know, a healthy and safe place to live and work and opportunities to, to create and work. And we just have different ways of communicating and going about it. And sometimes we get different ideas set on how to get there. And I think that what I'm excited about is where the conversation is going now in Idaho around how do we bridge those ideas on how and come up with collaborative solutions together. And our conversation in November was very heartening. Um, 
and I again want to reemphasize that goes to the not climate change, but changing climate. And I think as we heard here, there's, there's already actions being taken in order to do, address things. And that puts it more in the problem solving mode and more in the, you know, people wanting to go, okay, what do we need to do? And that, as we all know, it, and as brought up earlier, is people want to, don't want to be told what to do or they are not smart enough, they don't know what the problem is, but more the idea of let me be a part of this and let's help solve this and, and act. We had a question over there. Yeah. Hi, thank you for oh, Thank you for sharing all your perspectives. Uh, I have a question about the Idaho built environment. I am an owner of a green building company and I'm also on the Ketchum Planning and Zoning Commission. And this winter we saw the introduction of House Bill 547, which would prohibit local uh, jurisdictions, towns, counties uh, for passing their own building codes. Uh, that's really concerning to me because that seems like we're lowering the bar in a time period where we should be raising the bar and we should be demanding more uh, of our built environment. So how do you guys uh, align that sort of lowering the bar with these lofty goals of you know the 2030 uh, mission? I'll, I'll jump in on some of that actually. Um, and I, cause I was up here thinking, oh shoot, I didn't talk about building code codes because um, that did happen. And so thanks for being on planning and zoning. First off, I was on the Planning and Zoning Commission before I got on the City Council, um, and that's where you really geek out about um, the built environment and can and put that lens of climate and future preparedness um, into your thinking and making decisions. We, we this is this is an ongoing struggle with our state. Is um, as a city, I mentioned transit funding. Um, I forgot to mention building codes, which I'll touch on. Um, roads. We can only do what the city, what the state allows cities to do. And that, that's a long, it, it's gonna take a long-term strategy um, and we're in the middle of it now, of working with other cities that recognize it's in the best interest of our citizens to have progressive building codes, um, to have mo more tools in the toolbox to plan cities um, than we have right now. And so we need to create alliances that then go to the legislature. On the House bill that he was talking about, um, our city, at the, um, knowing that this would likely happen, um, well, waited for a year to pass the um, some energy efficiency and green building codes, and then knowing that we weren't going to get anywhere and that the legislature would likely act this year, we passed at the end of December new building codes because it is such an important part of ensuring that buildings are made appropriately for our people. And without telling builders what to do, what we're seeing here is they aren't doing it. Um, and so we passed that and are now grandfathered in as a city. Um, several other cities in the state had already passed it, um, but then the legislature tied the hands of future cities to update their building codes. I'll also speak to that. Another aspect of my business is working heavily in energy codes that raises the minimum standard that everybody has to comply with. I was in the trenches on House Bill 547. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some things that, that led to that where cities like Ketchum and cities like Boise, there were 18 cities in the state of Idaho that got fed up that our state building codes on the residential side are nearly a decade behind. That affects insurance rates, that affects the ability of cities to get coverage, it affects homeowners, it affects everybody. It's a lower standard of construction. It also affects you know, those that are worried about emissions and energy efficiency. Um, so the residential builders really drove that. It only affects residential, but in the end, even though it passed, it um, did grandfather in approximately 18 cities. And all I can say is we'll continue to fight the battle on, on codes in the state. So. I think we're out of time. Oh, yep, we're out of time. No, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.